Welcome to the Deeper Life Bible Study, coming to you from Identity Church in Deltona, Florida. Now let us hear the expounding of the Word of God, a now word for this moment. So grab your Bible, sit back as we delve into the Word of God, and hear the Logos and Rhema Word. Alright, I got a lot of notes. Pastor Charlie asked me if I would teach tonight, and I mean, I'm pretty okay at preaching stuff, you know, I can get emotional and just share who I am and what I'm doing in my life, and that's pretty easy, but teaching is another gift all in itself, so I tried to prepare, as you know, more, um, <clears throat> And I was seeing all these different topics. Okay, what am I going to teach about? And what, what do you want me to do, God? And he told me, and he put in my heart to teach on the book of Nehemiah, which is one of my favorite books of the Bible. I like Nehemiah. Yeah. It's, all, it's so silly. It's been through my head all, all week. It's like, Nehemiah, and it feels so good. <laughs> and that's just been in my head. Um, Yes. I said, Nehemiah, and it feels so good. And um, so, I mean, I've read the book a bunch of times, but, like, I'm going to try to do a little bit of a study about the book of Nehemiah. Um, I talked to Charlie today. I said, I'm not going to do the entire book because there would be too much, so I'm going to do a few chapters on it, and then if I ever get up again, I'll do more of it. But... It's interesting learning about a teaching. You know, it's something I, I normally, I read the Bible, but I don't study it very often. Um, I kind of just read it to fellowship, but taking a book apart and looking at it is a whole different experience. So let's have an overlook of Nehemiah, because I'm sure everyone here has read it, but for those of you who might not have read it, um, did you know that the original manuscripts had the book of Ezra and Nehemiah as one book? It was initially written that way, um, but when the Greeks took a look at it and they saw where it starts off saying the words of Nehemiah, son of Hakila, they said, okay, this is obviously a second thought here, so we're going to make it two books instead of one book. Um, the, the time when, 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 when this book took place was about a thousand years after the time of Moses and about 400 years before the birth of Christ. What had happened was Israel was destroyed and taken over by the Babylonians. It was completely desolate. It was a ghost town. Um, to the north, um, Israel was, was abandoned, and to the south, um, the kingdom of Judah was abandoned. There, it was, there was no one living there, and it had been like this. Um, the Temple of Solomon was destroyed. And it wasn't a good time. It's weird, too, when you read the Bible, like, when you read these books of the Bible, you think, like, all this happened in, like, a five-year period, and, like, from the beginning to the end, and you realize there's hundreds, if not thousands of years in between some of these things. And then when you put that into our perspective of where we're at in history, like, the American Empire is so new compared to things that have happened. And, you know, I mean, Israel at this time was, was in danger of just becoming a... A history book lesson you know of course we know that God was never gonna let that happen but I mean this is what the time the 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 Jews were deported to Babylonia um, there was about they had been they had been in Babylonia for about 70 years at the time and they started making homes for themselves they started living under the Babylonian Kings and they started being okay in their new place to live. There was, at the time still where I'm at, there was um, no one in Jerusalem. I mean, it was, the walls were down, as if you know about the book, the walls were down, the, the gates were burnt up, and um, I'm just going to read a little bit out of Nehemiah 1 to get us a base of where we're at. <clears throat> and the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakilia. It came to pass in the month of Chislev in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah. 
And I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived captivity, captivity and concerning Jerusalem. So what we need to understand was about 70 years after they had been taken into Babylonia, there was room for them to go back to Jerusalem. It's estimated there were two to three million Jews at the time living in Babylonia. And out of that, around 50,000 people returned, which is less than 2% of the people wanted to go back to the promised land that they had been promised. The rest of them had made their lives, they had set their peace up, and they were doing their own thing. Unfortunately, for the ones that went back, it was not good. They're in a city with no walls, no homes, no defenses, no nothing. And, and, it, and he even talks about them as being those who escaped and surviving captivity. And he says, the survivors who are left from captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates are burned with fire. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those you love and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now day and night. For the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. This goes to things that Charlie's taught us. If you look at Nehemiah, Nehemiah wasn't like some poor guy, okay? Nehemiah lived in, what's the name of that town again? In, he lived in the capital, capital of Babylonia, which was Shuna, and he lived in the citadel, which was the royal kingdom. And so he was a man who had a lot of authority. He had people under him and, of course, over him. But what I love about this is you see him praying, and you see him praying, and then, the, and then it's like the last line of chapter 1 here. It says, for I was the king's cupbearer. So this is not normal. And I picture it like a movie. It's like all this praying, dun 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 And then sounds, for I was the king's cupbearer. dun 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 And like he's the man. And so these prayers that he's praying, he's getting ready to talk to the king. And he can talk to the king. Not, not all these people could talk to the king. He had favor with the king. If you don't know, the cupbearer for the king was someone back in the day, back in these days, the way politics were done is people were executed and killed. They were poisoned. They were things. So the cupbearer was in charge of the king's cups and would actually, when people would pour a drink, he would make sure there was no poison in it. He would, and the king trusted him enough to make sure that nothing was going to happen. So you got to like somebody in order to trust them to that level. Um, the book of Nehemiah starts about 15 years after Ezra ends. At the time, Ezra is already in Jerusalem. <clears throat> Ezra was the one who established the law back over in Jerusalem and in Israel. <clears throat> um, let's see. Sorry. Go on here. Let's see what? Bear with me. I apologize. So. Um, so, so the main, the main thing that, that what, what's happening in here that I, that I like is when we go through something in our life, when the doctor gives us bad news or the world gives us bad news or we hear something that, that, that's going to affect us, Nehemiah, the first thing he did was it says he dropped to his knees and started mourning. It was such a shock. He was so saddened at the state of Israel that he, he couldn't even hold, him, hold, hold up his own weight. He started praying. <clears throat> he didn't do anything but pray, and then it says he fasted. He fasted and he prayed. He, what he was doing at this point was saying, okay, God, here am I. What do you want me to do? He wasn't doing it. He did no actions at this time yet. He hadn't gone there. I, I, I mean, looking at this, at the age that he was, he'd probably never been there. You know, he knew nothing about Israel, although I'm sure it was passed down stories of, of what had happened there, but I, I don't show that he'd ever been there in his life. But it was his homeland, and 
very important thing in the Bible. And, and his father's name, the son of, what was his father's name again? I'm sorry. The son of Hakalia means, Hakalia means waiting on the Lord. And so I believe this father had his son, he was waiting on the Lord. And, and his son, who grows to prominence as the king's cupbearer, decides he's going to do something. And it's awesome. And, and the first step that any of us should do when we come up against pressure in our lives is we need to pray. We need to ask God what he wants us to do before we do something. I have tended to be the exact opposite in my life a lot of times. I tend to do things and then ask God questions later. <clears throat> and that doesn't really work out well often. Um, I mean, there's grace. He knows our hearts. He knows what we're trying to do. But, you know, it, sometimes just take a deep breath and relax a little bit. <clears throat> and Nehemiah did that. Um, Nehemiah went, went to God. Um, a lot of us, when we face crisis, we say we're too busy to pray. You know, there's, um, let me see one second here. Because we, we think we have to do action. But Nehemiah didn't do action. And bear with me. I'm, like I said, I'm nervous. I don't like to do this. <laughs> but the Lord is good. And he is faithful. <clears throat> and um, so the next thing that happens that we read in the book of Nehemiah is that he has a chance to speak to the king. And when he gets his chance to speak to the king, we know something's going to go down here. Um, there comes a time when you start planning things, when you take your prayers, and, it, you know, as, as Christians, we know when we pray, God's going to give us answers. He's going to give us a, a plan of action. And it's time to get stuff done and move from the praying realm to the what-do-I-do realm. Nehemiah goes before King... Um, Art, Artaxerxes and bought him his wine. And Artaxerxes could see that there was something wrong with him. He was sad in the face. And um, basically what happened is he's like, what's, what's the matter? And he says, my heart's breaking for my city Israel and I want to go back and I want to do, I want to rebuild the walls. And he agrees to let him go. First, but the first thing he does is he says, well, how long is this going to take you? And it doesn't, it, he doesn't explain how he did it. He goes, we talked about it and then it was pleasing to let him go. Then not only does he let him go, he says, well, I need, I need safe passage, so I need letters from you. <clears throat> the king of Persia is like the king back then. Um, he gets letters for safe passage. He gets letters to give other kingdoms saying, you're going to give me timber. You're going to give me the supplies I need. So th this guy's got everything he wants. And the second thing that we need to do is when we're ready for God to do something, we, we start going in action. We start putting plans into action. Um, the story here that I read was about Dwight Moody, who everybody should know of. He was sailing on an ocean vessel and a fire broke out. One of his traveling companions said, don't you think we should go out and pray, Brother Moody? And Moody replied, you can go and pray, Brother, but I'm going to the man with the water buckets. Because sometimes when we've prayed, when we're ready, it's time to turn prayer to action. Um, how many times in, in my life have I always, have I prayed for things and prayed for things and prayed for things? And God's like, will you just stop praying for this and go do it? Because the only way it's going to happen at some point is putting action. We use the prayer more as a guideline to ask God what he wants us to do. Okay, God, how do I handle this? Okay, Anthony, I want you to handle this by going to the king, and I want you to go to the king and tell him this. All right, God, and if we continually just pray about what he wants us to do, he's going to say, I told you I want you to go to the king and I want you to do it this way. But, and so there comes a point where we just have to go forth and take a risk. Now, it was risky at the time for Nehemiah to go before the king and ask him a favor like this because the king could easily have just said, off with your head, you know, you're no longer loyal to me, your heart's in another place and you're thinking about other things and I don't like that. But one thing I like about Nehemiah is he, he seemed very confident once he got the word from God what he was supposed to do. And he was going to do it come hell or high water. Um, and God had a plan for him. We have to realize when, when God tells us to do something and, and, and we get up to do something, the enemy is usually there to try to prevent us from doing it. And that comes in fear, intimidation, <clears throat> and all those things. <clears throat> um, 
myself here for a minute. I think I overnoted myself. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I definitely overnoted myself here. It's how we learn. Thank God. There's grace. Oh, my gosh. But so, so in the book of Nehemiah, he, he, he goes and he, he has permission to, from the king to go, and he goes to the city of Jerusalem. Now, so now one, one thing I found that I really enjoyed was when he gets there, he goes and he sees the destruction. I mean, he had never seen it, but he goes and witnesses the destruction at this point. The, 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 the walls burning, the house is torn down, the gates on fire. I mean, it's a mess. But he doesn't cry anymore about it. He cried when he heard it. But when the man was put on the mission to go fix it, there was no more room for crying anymore. Now it's your time to fix it. And he went there with an attitude of, we're going to fix this. And I, I really enjoyed that. I thought that was an awesome thing. And there's a lot of, um, in, in Nehemiah chapter 3, there's a lot of the gene, genealogy of the people that were there. <clears throat> there was all different factions of Israelites there, different groups. And he goes before them. Nehemiah is a gifted administrator. I mean, you don't get to his prominent role unless you are. And so what he does is he says, okay, we're going to, instead of making this a huge job for everybody, we're going to give everybody a little job. And if you do your little job and I do my little job and we do our little jobs, we'll get this job done pretty quickly. Sometimes in the church, we, we need to do the same thing. <clears throat> we can't rely on Charlie to do all the job, Pastor Charlie can't rely on Pastor Jeff and Pastor Pan to do all the job. Our pastors are kind of administrators, and they'll set elders, and they'll set board members, and they'll set people to handle things and put out certain fires that they got to do other stuff, and, and we have to understand that, and that's a good thing. <clears throat> hmm. So, but the, the job was a big job. And, and Nehemiah came to this place, and I mean, these people were desolate, and they were poor, and they didn't have food, and they didn't have water. They didn't, I mean, they were just suffering people that were still there, kind of left over. And um, he was, the fact that he was able to coalesce these people and put them together and get them moving in the same direction. And he was a newcomer. He just kind of came in and said, I know you guys have been here for a few years, but I'm coming in and I'm kind of taking over and this is the mandate from God. And they accepted that, which God had to be on his side for that. And then we then then at the same time. When we go to chapter four, we start dealing with our enemies. There was a couple of enemies of Nehemiah. Tobiah was an Ammonite. Um, Sambalot. And these were men, um, they, they, say, they say that um, Sambalot was from a very wealthy um, Babylonian family. And he, was, he didn't, him and Tobiah, Tobiah they said was, um, was an Ammonite and he was in the royal family with the Ammonites. And neither of these guys wanted Israel built back up. These are the enemies of Israel. But the funny thing is they were, kind of re they were kind of prevented from just going to war because the king of Persia put a stamp of approval on it. So instead of going to war, what they started doing was harassing. And I think that in our Christian lives, if we really believe God's sovereign, the enemy can't really do anything to us. I mean, the devil can only do what God lets him do. He's on a leash. So what the enemy can do is harass us. He can whisper things at us. You can't do that. But you think you're going to be in a, in a holy thing here? You think you can get up there and talk? Or you think you can sing? Or you, know, oh, you think you can really get out of poverty? Or, you know, and he'll, he'll do these things. He can't lay his hands on us. But my God, if we're not the best enemy that we've ever faced, because we take these things and we start believing them. You're right, I can't do it. I'm not even going to show up to church and try to teach. I'm not going to, no way, man, this guy's not buying a car for me. There's nothing I can do, buddy, you know. And, and we go through that, and we, and we, 
believe the lies. The, the, you know, the devil is the accuser of the brethren. That's what he does. He accuses us. He, he lies. He intimidates. He is like a roaring lion seeking he, whom he can devour. He can't devour nobody if they don't want him to devour him, though. He's a fraud and a phony, and he has been. And someday the word says, we'll look at him and we'll say, this is the one who caused all this problem? This guy right here? But, you know, it's kind of like Dumbo being afraid of the little mouse, you know? That's kind of what it, you know, or it's like me being afraid of the little spider on the floor because <laughs> I will jump farther than any fat guy can jump, man, when I see a spider. You'll be like, oh my gosh. Oh, no, no, no. They're evil creatures from the devil. and <laughs> They are curses, right? Like insects are curses. I, I, I think they read that somewhere. I don't know. That's my story. <clears throat> I'm going to stick to that. <laughs> no, but so so these so these guys are are starting to harass them, and they're, and they're nervous that they might come at them. Nehemiah doesn't know what's going on, so what he does is he is he rounds up his people, and he says, "Okay, we're going to work together here. So while you guys are working during the day, we're going to have these other guys here guarding overnight, because they have no wall yet. A city without walls back then." would be like you having your house with no doors, no windows, and having all your gold just sitting in the middle of the room so for somebody to come and steal. There's nothing. And um, it used to happen a lot back then. So what he would say is he, he posted people around the workers while the workers were working, and then while the workers were sleeping, he had other people watching. So it was always being guarded. And... Show me your face, Lord. Show me your face. And gird up my legs that I might stand in this holy place. Show me your face, Lord. Your power and grace. And I can make it till the end. If I can just see your face. The, the enemy tries to show his face to us. And it can be scary if we let it. <clears throat> but as much opposition in reading the book of Nehemiah and understanding, he, he gathered up his people and he got them to watch over around the gates and, and around the city from the outsiders. And as soon as he gets that fire turned out, here come the grumblings from within. And gosh, tell me we don't deal with that at church. <laughs> tell me we don't deal with that in life. You know, sometimes your best friends and, and your closest circle are the ones that can just wreck your day. You know, because listen, if an enemy comes at me, I expect it. But if my brother comes at me or my sister comes at me, it's like, what? I don't want to deal with that, you know. The, the enemy can never surprise you. Your friends and family can surprise you sometimes. And it stings a lot worse. And what, what it seemed was happening was there, like I said, there was all these different factions of Israelites at the time. And some of the upper ones had sold land to the, the lower ones. And the, there was a lot of class systems back then. And they were taxing them and making them give half of their food and doing all these things. So these people were working their lands like indentured servants, basically. And they started grumbling, like, we're working, we're doing all this stuff, and we're not going to reap any of the rewards from it, and, and we don't want to do it anymore, and maybe we should just go back. And it, it's funny how, it's funny, even if you go back to the days of Moses, how quickly the Israelites wanted to go back to Egypt after they had just crossed over the ocean. God separated 
the ocean, and they walked across it. And as soon as something comes up, we should just go back. He sent us out there to kill us. I've had, how many, I've had that so many times happen to me, where it's like everything's going really great, and all of a sudden something comes in, I'm like, oh God, you're just going to kill me now, aren't you? You're just going to, it's like, God's like, yeah, I did all this just to take you out. That, that's, that's my plan for you. It's like, all right, I guess I'm an idiot. But uh, it's funny how we do that. They don't, we don't, we don't, we're horrible at seeing the big picture. Sometimes we're great at it, but other times when it comes personal to us, if we're not careful to put it into perspective, it gets hard to see the big picture on things. They were having a hard time seeing the big picture. However, what these rulers were doing was wrong to the people. <clears throat> so Nehemiah stepped up again, and he gathered these rulers and had a meeting with them, and he said, listen, God's led us back into our promised land from the captors, and here you are taking them captive again. Why are you doing this? Don't you understand? And, I mean, this guy must have been, you know, he wasn't a Donald Trump. You know, this guy was a, 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 a talker and a great diplomat, obviously, because he, turned, he got people to change their minds really quick. Um, and they all agreed with him, and they all gave everybody back what was theirs. And so now they were able to work again. And um, so that's kind of where I'm going to stop about Nehemiah is that they're back working again. And they're working on building the wall. One of the things that I love so much about <clears throat> this book, and the thing that always spoke to me the most about it was, later on you'll see when he actually starts rebuilding the wall, he had to use the same bricks that, he, that the wall was before. They were burnt and they were messy, but no, he had to use the same bricks. And I believe that's how God is with us. It's the same Anthony, you know, from before I was saved, and once I became a Christian, he used the same flesh, the same everything to rebuild who I am. He does that with all of us. A <clears throat> um, couple of inter interesting things. Um, during this time in Babylon, some of the notable faithful people... Um, Daniel, um, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego were in this area in this time. Esther was during this time. She became the queen of Persia. There was a lot of, lot of cool stuff going on. <clears throat> and uh, I believe all of us have walls that we have to build up. Not defense walls, because those should be down by now. Um, some of us build up walls... That's not these kind of walls. I'm talking about foundation walls. Um, and you know, listen, sometimes when we go through something, our walls get smashed. Our gates are on fire. Anything that wants to run through them will run right through them. And it won't take long before we're desolate inside. And when, when God, it's kind of like that. When, when God shows you, all right, it's time okay, God, how's, how's the gates of Anthony doing? And God says, well, the survivors aren't doing well, Anthony. And uh, <laughs> the, wall, the walls are ruined and the, the gates are on fire. And sometimes you do. You fall down to your knees and you start crying and you start repenting and mourning. <clears throat> and then you go to the king. And you say, king, I need to go back. I need to rebuild this. Can I have the supplies that I need? He gives us our supplies. And we go back, and, and once, like, same thing, once we get over the, the fear and we take a, an honest self-evaluation of ourselves, there's no more crying in it. It's time to move forward. Have you ever, I was discussing this with a friend at work. <clears throat> I know, I, I'll say, okay, I'll say I'm the only one who's ever sinned as a Christian. So, um, But have you ever had a time, usually, for most people, when, when, they're, when they're born again and they fall, they fall into a sin, it's like a spiral. Shh, they go down the toilet. But there's been a couple times, and I'm learning how to do this, where when I sin, I get right over it. I say, you know what? Okay, God, I did this. Not, not excusing it, but it's behind me. I can't take it back. I'm moving forward, and I won't be reminded of it again. 
And it's so weird because you almost feel bad that you're doing that. But that's what God is like, no, I can move forward now and I can go do what I need to do now. And sometimes we have, we, I think probably all the time, if we'll ever really catch what God wants to do in our lives, we have to live like that. That's where Paul says, it's, when I sin, it's not me sinning, it's sin living in me. That's not an excuse to go sin, but that's the reality of who we are in Christ. You know, Kevin spoke about how there's no more sin problem. Charlie spoke about how sin's been dealt with, and it has. So when we do these things, it's another entity inside of us, because if first, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, if we're in Christ, we're a new creation, old things are passed away, all has become new. So these things that, are, that come up are just the reality of the situation, but you have to move past it. And when we do that, there's no more crying. Because, come on, the thing that, I think one of the things that keeps people in bondage is the depression, is the condemnation, is all these things. You know, I know some, I knew some really corrupt men of God who took what I just said to a level of they could do no wrong. That's wrong. That's silly. Because, I mean, even the word says if we deny that we sin, then we're lying to ourselves. But when we do, there's an intercessor there who's forgiven us before we could have ever done it. Which is why by faith, we are as perfect as Jesus Christ could ever be. He gave us everything. He told us to go do more than he could ever do. So when we go to the king and we have to repair our wall, and then we take a self-evaluation, we look at it, we start to fix it. And it's important at that point, because guess what? The harassers are going to be there. If you're trying to get out of a, let's say you're trying to get out of a, a, an addiction. Let's try, you're saying you're trying to get out of a situation. Guess what? That voice is going to be there. Those friends are going to be there. Oh, you can't do that. You can't read. Oh, you don't want to go out anymore. You don't want to do this anymore or that anymore. Oh, remember how fun it was when we used to do this? And, and then how horrible you felt after you do it. And it's a spiral. You have to let it go. So you have to put guards up. You have to put posts up. Okay, while I'm working on this, while I'm reading my Bible every day, while I'm doing this, I can't hang out with you anymore for a while. I just can't be around. Not that I don't love you, because I do, but you know what? Every, one of the things I learned for me that worked <clears throat> when I had to get rid of some friends in my life is just continuously ask them to go to church. <laughs> and they'll just leave you alone. <laughs> they don't want to be a part of it. And it's okay, you know what I mean? It's like, that way you don't got to be a jerk. You can just say, oh yeah, I'm going to church tonight. Let's go. And they're like, no, no. And eventually they'll just stop calling you. Um, but they don't know how much fun it could be at church. Like, it's not, you don't say it to try to draw them away. You try to draw them in, you know. But they got their own road to walk on. Um, so as you do that, you start dealing with, with the outside influences. Then you start dealing with your own inside influences. You start grumbling. God, I've been trying to fix this. Can't get this wall built because I keep kicking it over. <laughs> Um, every time I think I, every time I get out, they pull me back in. Every time we start, every time it seems like we take two steps forward, I take one step back. And at that point, we have to calm down. We have to go back to the king. Always going back. That's the, the advantage. Nehemiah was like hundreds of miles away from the king. We are right in his face 24-7. And he will never not turn his scepter towards us. He will never not give us his attention. He l craves it when we, when we ask him things. And you have, to, you have to deny, sometimes you have to deny what you're seeing. Because you know what? You are improving. You are, like they were talking about you tonight, man. You are improving. I am improving. We are all on the right road here. We wouldn't be here on Thursday night if we weren't kind of dedicated to this thing, okay? <laughs> Believe me. And so, stop beating yourself up. Because we, we destroy our own walls. So anyway, that was my uh, brief look at the first few chapters of Nehemiah and then putting it into perspective of my life. So, thank you for your time. I got way done way quicker than Charlie could have. But thank you guys very much. Well done, young man. Thank you, Lord. One thing about Nehemiah, he understood kingdom. He did. 
He understood the protocol of kingdom on the world system. But yet he understood the kingdom when he got transferred, when he, when he got the, the paperwork, his credentials, that he was able to move over and go over to another country where his ancestors were from to reestablish the kingdom. It's very interesting that you, you picked Nehemiah, Anthony. You did a great job. You really did. That was awesome. I, li- I really like Nehemiah because there's a lot of things about Nehemiah. Like you said, the book is loaded. And it's really about kingdom. It really is. It's a blessing to be here this evening. Pastor Pam, want to get up here? Come on. She know, you know when she, the foot's going and the hand's going? You know she's got something. <laughs> she's going to hold off. All right. Ah, here it comes. <laughs> Anthony, what does God have for you? What are you supposed to do? Are you doing it? That's only the beginning, but that's the foundation. That's the main thing. Is spreading his love around. Honey, I love your heart, your sincerity, your transparency. And I'm excited at what God is doing in you. (laughs) Amen. Amen. You're going to be chair hopping. You chair hop with me. <laughs> Here we go. I'll do it just to embarrass her. <laughs> what, what I'm saying is, remember the verse that I, that I read about being boiling hot? Okay, that's his passion. That's his love. And Anthony, you emanate it. So thank you. Did a great job. Amen. Amen. Well, I guess um, um, Charlie and Susie will be back on. Oh, I walk. <laughs> <laughs> on um, um, Monday, is that right, guys? Be back on Monday, and we got Gary and Rodney. <laughs> Do you guys have fun? Is there anything you want to share? Hey, come on. Come on. Come on. For those of you who don't know, uh, Rodney and I went with Pastor Charlie and Pastor Susie up to Connellsville, Pennsylvania to uh, Pastor Higby's The Gathering. And Papa Jack was there and Mama Frida. And it was just, to me, it was a gathering of family. And that's what it looked like. That's what it felt like. No matter what we did, it wasn't about, to me, it wasn't about being in the church and listening to speakers. It was about being in the presence of godly men and women. That not, that they didn't look at the four walls and say, hey, this is who we are. It was a walls without church, it was a church without walls. And we met together, uh, Pastor Higby opened up his house on Friday afternoon, and there was a lot of people there. And it was all the sons, it was Papa Jack and Mama Frida, they're really, really, we're really big on, on fathering, fatherhood, father-son relationship. And there was this long table, and it was Pop, Papa Jack and, and Mama Frida was at the end, and, and then everybody just filtered in, and sat where they wanted to sit. But I sat back because this was the first time I'd ever been to one of these. And I just sat back and I just watched. And it was so neat to see. It was like, it was like mom and dad and all the brothers and sisters were around. And mom and dad was sitting down in the corner. And when, when someone wanted to talk to them, they would just go down to the corner and sit down. and Just like you're, you would talk to your mom and your dad. While that's happening, 
you see the brothers and sisters going, leave me alone. Oh, no, no, no. You're this, you're that. It's just like little bickering. And, and, and it wasn't really bickering, but it was, it was like, like when you're your brother with your sister, you're antagonizing each other. And that's what was going on. And I was going, yeah. And, and I just sat there and I thought, this is what it's about. This is what it's about. It's, it's gathering together as a family and serving God, then serving one, one another. And there was not, look who I am. I am the great. And all you others are servants. Not once that I experienced that. And that was before we even got into the church. It was phenomenal. Just to give you one reflection, one of the neat things that happened, um, on the afternoons on Saturday and Sunday, they did a whole time of ministry. And I think when the year that Kevin went up, they actually had like an appointment schedule, and you scheduled time for prayer, deliverance, healing, everything. It was very organized. And this year, they turned it into basically a freedom session. And they took, there were their sanctuaries a little bigger than this whole room. It's laid out differently. And they moved all the chairs out of the way, so they had one big room. And they had all the ministry teams around the room. And basically for two hours, about hour and a half to two hours, you just went wherever you wanted to go for ministry and you stood in line and you got ministered to. Now on Saturday, everybody was there. You know, Papa Jack and Frida had a station, Charlie and Susie, all the ministries had a station. Um, you ministered with Charlie and Susie. I was with Tommy Zukoski and his wife. And so you were a part of a team. So then you do Saturday night service, then you do Sunday morning service, and everybody is bushed. And we're supposed to do this again Sunday afternoon. So Sunday afternoon, one of the other pastors, Joel and Pam from New York, are preaching on, on healing. They're giving a brief message on healing, and then they're going to open this thing up again. None of the A-team is there. Nobody. And the room is about half as full as it was on Saturday. It wasn't as many people, because they had had their church service in the morning, they served lunch, and then Sunday night there was another, the ending service. So I'm sure people said, I'm going to go home in the afternoon, and I'm going to come back Sunday night. So here we are, it's really the B team, and probably 30, 40 people in the room, and Brianna, which is, I think, I kind of take her to be one of the associate pastors, so to speak, or one of the leadership, she makes an announcement that Pastor Brian and the leadership have been in a meeting, and they are very tired, and they're going to take the afternoon off, and they're not going to be back to this evening, but they want us to minister and carry on without them. Nobody left. And those that were there ministered for another hour and a half, two hours. We had to leave at one point. I, we, they were still ministering when we left. We had to leave to go to the airport at 3 o'clock. So it was just so cool because they became more of a body ministering to body. Some of their leadership stepped up and went into some of the groups that they hadn't been in the day before. There was fewer groups than the day before, but there was fewer people, so the length of the line in each group was about the same. And, and, and to me, that spoke to me about the maturity of the group that was there. That's what that said to me, because they weren't there just to get a word from Papa Jack or Mama Frida or from Charlie or from Brian. They were there to be with the Lord and to be in ministry and to be participate and partake in family. And that really touched me. At the, and it was at the end of the whole thing. It was like that was there was a, we didn't stay for the evening service because we had to fly home, but that was a really good last memory for me of the place. The other thing that I took away from it, and and I know Kevin said the same thing when he came back last year was we watched Brian's Pastor Brian's hospitality and ministry team put on a three day event. And the way they honored people and the level of hospitality that they gave, there's lessons to be learned there. Um, it was amazing. It really was. And it was not a small group of people. It wasn't six people doing all the work. It was 20 people doing, you know, whatever the number was. It was obvious that, and every pastoral couple 
had a person assigned to them to take care of their needs. There were drivers. I mean, Gary and I were fortunate. We had a car, so we pretty much drove Charlie and Susie around, but there were drivers for everybody because they didn't rent rental cars. Um, you know, it was just an amazing level of, like, honor and hospitality. I, I, I complimented Brian on that on the end of the week because it was just, it was like, wow. So it was a real positive experience. Um, I told Kevin I've never cried so much in one weekend before. It, I, I was broken in several of the services, and it was a good cry. And the Lord was moving. It was really good. So it was a good opportunity. When I was talking about family, I was t wasn't talking about us old folk in, in, in medium age. It was everybody. Yeah. Papa Jack talked, and he had everybody come, people come down to, so he can lay, lay hands on. So I said, you know what? I came to this conference just to glean off of people, just to, to feel the spirit and get regener uh, you know, rejuvenated. So I didn't go down there. And I'm just slouched back, and I had my eyes closed, and I hear, excuse me. I opened my eyes, and there was a nine-year-old boy with, in a suit. He said, would you like to get prayer? I said, yeah, but I'd want to go down there. I'm, I, I'm okay right here. He said, well, if you want to get prayer, we'll go down. I said, no, but I do need prayer. But if I'm going to get prayer, you're going to pray for me. And he goes, okay, it's a nine-year-old. He says, what is wrong with you? I said, well, if you're going to pray for me, you're going to have to ask God what's wrong with me. He said, okay. He closed his eyes and he started praying. And what I was going through, he nailed it. I didn't tell him anything, but he told me what was going on with my body. I was, had back problems, and I was getting up in the middle of the night. He was, he would, he'd even say, you were getting up in the middle of the night because of your back. It's a nine-year-old. He's done. I look up at the altar, and one, one, one of the hospitality guys was sitting on the altar, and there was a seven-year-old walking around him, laying, I, laying hands on him. And then all of a sudden, I hear, out, out. Out, out, and I'm going, what's going on here? They get done. I call Kenny over. I said, Kenny, what happened here? He goes, well, this little guy came up and asked for prayer, so I prayed for him. Afterwards, I said, will you pray for me? He said, yes. He said, but you're too big, so would you sit down here so I can lay hands on you? He's a seven-year-old. Yeah. So he starts praying for me, and he starts casting out the spirit of pain. And he said, I was in pain. Seven-year-old. Sunday morning, I see the little guy, and he look, comes up and he goes, I know you. I said, no, you don't. I said, well, I've never, I've, I didn't introduce myself to you. He goes, no, I know you. I said, I know you do. But before you leave, before I leave today, I want you to pray for me, seven-year-old. So what Rodney was talking about, right before ministry, I'm sitting down there, and all of a sudden, there's a little guy standing right in front of me, not saying a word, just... I said, you're here to pray for me, aren't you? He goes... And he goes into a prayer that just reminds you that there's no such thing as a grown-up spirit and a child spirit. He got into the spirit and started praying for me, and I just wept. And it was over, after it was over, I just grabbed him and gave him a hug. That nine-year-old boy comes over, lays hands on the seven-year-old boy, and starts counseling him, saying, Don't worry, you're, you're gifted. And when you go to school, they're going to call you a, a, a Jesus freak. But you're okay. You're going to be okay. And I'm 
just going, that's the quality of people and the teaching and the family gathering that they have. It's possible, saints. We just have to go out there and do it and open up our hearts. It's like Pastor Jeff said, it's all about the kingdom. It's kingdom. No matter what we do, it's kingdom. Amen. Thy kingdom come as in heaven on earth. So if we're walking on earth, we have Kevin, heaven and we bring it down. The kingdom to here for everyone to be. Listen, Identity Church, we love you. Thank you for being with us on live stream tonight. And we have a giving app if you'd like to give to us as well. On anybody that's listening that's on live stream, uh, tomorrow night we have men's fellowship at Rodney's house. And if you need information, if you have Rodney's telephone number, text him and he'll give you the address of where to get to. And you all be blessed. Enjoy the rest of your evening. And have a kingdom-filled day tomorrow. God bless. Bye-bye. Thank you for tuning in to today's message from Identity Church. To know more about us, go to IdentityChurch.net. There you'll find resources such as a calendar, media, and upcoming events. You can also download an app for your mobile device from the Apple App Store or Google Play. Then from your mobile device, you can hear our messages, read from the Bible, take notes, connect with us on social media, and even pay your tithe. Again, thank you for tuning into Identity Church Deeper Life Bible Study. See you next week.